Hi all, our notable game today is another classic Bobby Fischer game that I'd like to show you. It was against Wolfgang Unzicker in the Varna Olympiad final, 1962. So the, the 1962 Olympiad was held actually in Bulgaria. That's Veselin Toplov's country, by the way. So Unzicker, Fischer's opponent here, was awarded uh, the IM title in 1950, GM title in 1954. He was West German champion in 1948, 50, 52, 59, 63, 65 jointly. And he played on actually 13 West German chess Olympiad teams between 1950 and 1982, sharing the prize of the best top ball prize for the West German team at the 1950 Olympiad. Another first ball triumph propelled his West German team to success during the Tel Aviv Olympiad of 1964, where he scored 13 and a half points, and he assisted his team to winning the bronze medal after a 3-1 team victory over the Soviet Union. So a fantastic Olympiad player. In this game, he was white against Fischer, and he played e4. Fischer played Sicilian defense, knight f3, and we go into the classic open Sicilian Neudorf variation, which is characterized by a6. Now we have a modest move, usually in live book, bishop e3 or bishop g5 are the mo two most popular. The third most popular, bishop e2. We have e5, not minding the d5 square. This can be potentially vulnerable. It sets the scene strategically for the game. Is this d5 going to be a fatal weakness positionally? The knight goes to b3 here. Now on b3, it can be quite useful for supporting things like a4 and a5. Although it's limited in scope, it seems. If if white gets in a5, for example, this is a nice bind on the dark squares, stopping the thematic b5. Bishop e6 is played here. And white castles. And you'll note, with the knights here, this f pawn is actually has some mobility potentially, which could usefully potentially attack the bishop on e6. We have now a move which doesn't try and develop the king side. Fisher plays knight bd7 here. Now this position is known to live book, and usually uh, plays with white. Bishop e3 is, has been played quite a bit, or a4. f4 is the third most popular move. It has its own ideas. The immediate f5 threatens uh, that bishop. If the bishop has to take, then that doesn't help black's d5 square control. We actually have queen c7 now. So this provides the opportunity for bishop c4 if the event on f5. That actually happens now. f5 is played. White is subtly weakening his dark squares a bit by putting the pawns on light squares. Bishop c4. Then we have a4, because black is actually wanting to play b5 here. a4 restricts that. The rooks are disconnected, so this really stops b5. The rook's not protected by anything here on a8. By the way, I should say this game was actually featured on Midsummer uh, Murders, this uh, TV program, which has a record number of murders at each episode. They had an episode called The Sicilian Defense. Let's summon night murders. Uh, so check that out. I'll give you a link to the um, IMDb somewhere in the description of the video. So anyway, Bishop E7 was played here. It's a delicate position for D5 control. It seems why it doesn't really gain anything for, by Bishop G5, which you might think is the most direct way of undermining D5 uh, controlled by black. Why actually plays Bishop E3, focusing attention on the dark squares a bit on the queen side. Black now castles. And now again, we have A5. So it's why it's gone for this grip on the dark squares here, particularly against B5, designed against B5. But nevertheless, uh, Fisher is tempted to play b5. Maybe a lot of players wouldn't, a lot of club players wouldn't. White might actually continue with rook a4 to b4 to put more pressure on the queen side here as well. So we have this b5 which stops any idea like that. But isn't there a structural compromise, you might think? 
After A takes, we have a backward pawn, this A6 pawn. Slightly vulnerable, you might think. Knight takes B6. Now, if black is left to his own devices, he might be taking here, followed by knight c4, and that could be actually very annoying, because then there's ideas like knight takes b2, looking at the bishop. White plays what looks to be a slightly controversial decision, though, to parry this threat. Although black would seem to have reasonable play, peace play, for the structural weakness that, that Fisher has volunteered, the a6 pawn. In this position, why actually decides to give up the dark square bishop here? It's a forcing move, but uh, if we look strategically now, white's pawns on uh, light squares means that the dark squares are actually more vulnerable than usual. This set of dark squares, in particular, and perhaps white should keep the king on a light square inferior away from this potentially dangerous bishop. It doesn't look at all dangerous at the moment. This bishop. For the moment, now, this bishop's hanging. Does white want to take on e2? No, Fisher actually played bishop b5 here. He wants to shield his a6 weakness. If he took on e2, it would seem very, very clear cut for white to just build up on a6 with a move like rook a5 and just treble the pressure on the pawn a6 pawn. It looks as though black's pieces would not be very happy here. The bishop's still hemmed in. White's got a nice grip on d5. So this bishop b5 seems to create enough compensation for the moment for any structural defects or a6 and d5 that black has. White actually takes now, which uplifts this pawn away from the glare of the a-file pressure. And then we have knight d5, a forcing move, obviously. But uh, the outpost with the queen after taking uh, it's getting dangerous just, just to leave that. I uh, can't really be left. Queen takes d5. Uh, white is threatening the rook. Now, white do black doesn't want to give the a file on the plate here. Fisher plays a nice little move using that b5 pawn. Rook a4. Yes, rook a4. Okay, so if we look at this position, this bishop still seems... A little bit hemmed in but actually it's not so bad it's got this diagonal to come into the game onto these dark squares which are a bit weak in theory um, and if taking then black's going to be taking the pawn on b2 etc that's going to be nasty so we have c3 here now black has to be careful he doesn't want to run into something like this because then queen takes a8 is two rooks for the queen. So he's got to be careful about how he uses the A file. Fisher actually plays queen A6. And now potentially queen A8 is possible to try and challenge the queen on D5. We have to move H3, slightly weakening the dark squares a bit more. And we have now rook C8. So there's a couple of ideas, maybe to challenge the queen, but also potentially maybe even rook c4 but at the moment there's always a knight d2 if e4 is pressured like that we have rook f e1 and now the move h6 giving the king some air and the white king goes on to a dark square in principle when the opponent has a bishop and you don't have a counterpart sometimes it's a little bit dangerous to put your king on the same color as the opponent's bishop and in fact here after bishop g5 Although bishop f4 isn't immediately that significant, it's a danger now that bishop f4 is available to black. Um, White slightly over panics about this. Perhaps he should have just put his king back on h1. It's not such a big deal, this position. So black has that dark square advantage. Um, but it's, it's not so clear after king h1 what black is doing here's an example variation um instead of the move g3 because it, it's when we do pawn moves which are irreversible it's good to examine was it was it really needed let's have a look at alternative to g3 which was played because it's a very committal decision basically irreversible queen d3 is white holding on let's say queen a7 as though queen f2 Rook a2, let's imagine this scenario with the queen coming to f2. Is it a big deal? Well, 
and say rook f1 it shouldn't be the queen is guarding g3 so there's no time really to build up an attack on the dark squares with just bishop and queen here if the queen is repelled then white can just sit still and just go for a draw here the grip on d5 should be enough although the knight's not the most amazing knight in the world it shouldn't be losing for white this position but in the game white played g3 and you might think well okay it's a capital decision but is it really fatal it puts white in a very precarious position now we'll see that queen a7 with the idea of coming to f2 but with g3 there are some other subtle weaknesses in the position king g2 and fisher starts to expose what those weaknesses are the problem with g3 with the move rook a2 threatening now rook takes b2 check very very tricky position the rook is pinned to the queen so white thought he could just now play in this position king f1 it is actually a tricky position but here at move 26 can you see what black played which caused white to resign i'll give you five seconds to pause the video so this is a knockout blow on move 26 black to play so you might want to pause the video here and try and work out what the final move is which actually wins the game here okay okay the final move which fisher plays is rook takes c3 yes the g3 had compromised the second rank a rook on the seventh statistically wins a lot of games and in fact let's look at this final position then why did white resign well if rook takes them black can throw in check it's a very nasty check to throw in and this is uh, going to be crushing it's useful that blacks played h6 let's just absolutely engine check this position uh, so say here check black is picking up the rook with check that's the big problem actually and it's a forced checkmate there's no time it's all running with check after that after rook takes a2 yeah it's it's just uh nothing here sorry rook f3 nothing here for white if he goes to e2 let's have a quick look at this check now if king d1 queen takes a2 is very good with queen b1 as an idea if he goes to d3 let's look at the outrageous d3 in this position now this is slightly interesting because black is technically a rook down right but there's actually a mate in 15 can you spot it <laughs> the engine picks up a mate in 15 here in this variation and this is pretty clever stuff fisher might have had to calculate this <laughs> pretty sure he did it's actually gone to a mate in 14 much easier so if i give you five seconds what is the first move of the mate in 14 okay i'll show you it queen c7 i'm glad i turned on the engine there now white could throw in a check it doesn't do anything but let's, let's throw in this check black is controlling c1 here so rook c1 we can just take that very useful to control c1 so the threat here is queen c2 and sorry after king h7 what does white actually do white's pretty uh stuck here the engine choice is actually either knight c5 mass trying to delay things there's also sorry there's also another threat of uh, potentially rook d2 if the knight moves so if knight c5 that's that's the snag there check and here just taking the queen is winning so that's the end of knight c5 doesn't seem like an amazing uh defense rook c1 doesn't seem like an amazing defense either takes 
Knight c5, it's all pretty desperate. It's just losing the queen. Yeah, the engine defense is all pretty desperate in this position. So this is an absolutely amazing move, actually. If you factor in the king trying to get to the center here on king d3, it's actually queen c7, which is an absolutely killing move in this position, it seems. And let's just look at some other ideas after this rook takes c3. Well, if takes, this is the easy one to rule out, then check mate here. And other things just lose material basically. Knight e4, well, we're just going to take on a1. Just losing material, there's nothing for it there. Yeah, so I think that's the most important uh, defense to, to check out. Uh, is is taking the rook here king come to the center so what does this game uh show us it was actually one of fisher's uh memorable games in the classic my 60 memorable games book so it was an olympiad game in bulgaria against the very very strong uh west german champion so against the west germany team uh, it shows us that the resources are, are quite good especially on the dark squares in the sicilian Nidorf. Well, it's classic d5 strategy, uh, he, which he was prepared to play bishop takes b6 to support, did give up white's dark square bishop. When the opponent loses a bishop of a certain color, that's the time to try and emphasize that color, those color weaknesses. And it seems black was getting into a good position with his bishop on g5 and that h6 to control at least this diagonal and actually caused, perhaps prompted g3. So it was the weaknesses on the dark squares which actually caused a potentially fatal second rank weakness which was actually picked up expertly with this move rook takes c3 the second rank rank weakness created by the potential dark square weaknesses uh caused that fatal tactic at the end but white in theory could have held the position but nevertheless you know if, if people don't make mistakes a lot of the games a lot more games will end in draws uh so that's the fun of chess but uh, some weaknesses beforehand created the context for the blunder. Blunders are, are rarely in a vacuum. It's it's really to do with, I believe, you know, color square complex uh, weaknesses stemming from the opening. Uh, okay, I hope you got something out of that. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.